Okay, so this video is for my dad in the event that he is unable to make it to my dissertation defense on August 16th. So I'd like to welcome everybody. And then first, I've been asked to tell the group how it came to pass that I pursued a PhD at Drake. So I've been high achieving all my life. So naturally my dad wanted me to be a doctor. Eventually, I did convince him that music and teaching were my true callings, so we established together that I would get my PhD in one of those fields, kind of like a compromise. Years went by, and as soon as I finished my master's, boy, dad started asking and asking and asking about that PhD. But at that time, I had two boys, uh, Lincoln and Jake, who were 11 and 14, and they still occasionally wanted me around. So I waited. And then I was hired at IS, Iowa State in 2016, and so many people in my department have terminal degrees that I really recommitted to that promise that, yes, this was something I was going to do. But at the same time, I was singing and dancing, acting, mentoring, teaching. I had a very full life. And then in 2018, I got some kind of horrible lung infection that lasted for more than a year. And during that time, when I couldn't really rely on my performance skills to fill my bucket anymore, I... Um, and with the blessing of my sainted husband, Travis, and my two boys, I applied to Drake. I never considered any school except Drake because I had so deeply admired Drs. Cooper, Beiser, and Staplin in my master's program. And because I really wanted in-person learning. Of course, COVID had other ideas. It was actually in Dr. Cooper's research methods class that I first became interested in creative self-efficacy development. So creative self-efficacy is a belief that you have the skills to overcome a creative challenge. In that class, Research Methods, I wrote a research brief on the state of creative music education and found some really sobering information. While fostering creativity had gained a lot of prominence throughout education in the last several years, many teachers were still privileging algorithmic learning, like that which can be measured by you know, standardized tests. Fine arts teachers were also failing to promote heuristic thinking. Despite clearly articulated creative outcomes in the National Core Art Standards, high levels of autonomy, no standardized testing, and strong public perceptions that fine arts teachers are, of course, fostering creativity. It's the fine arts. Some research had already been conducted which showed that poor creative self-efficacy was often cited among the barriers to promoting creativity in music, but among all subgroups of music teachers, elementary general music teachers were found to be significantly more likely to promote creative outcomes. So I started digging. Was there any research that examined all the intersecting factors that contribute to elementary general music teachers' creative self-efficacy? And did the research community have a good idea about how creative self-efficacy might be developed among music teachers? When it became obvious that the answer was really no, I decided to investigate how elementary general music teachers describe the people, context, and processes that influence the development of their creative self-efficacy. And I designed my research for my dissertation with that purpose in mind. I had a couple of big research questions that I wanted to answer. First, how do elementary general music teachers describe the people, context, and processes that influence the development of their creative self-efficacy? And how is that creative self-efficacy manifested in their classrooms? I should say that I live and work very close to this research problem. I am an elementary general music teacher with several mastery level certifications. I also teach graduate students who want advanced certification in the Kodai approach. I'm also a teacher trainer in that I teach music and elementary education at the undergraduate level, and I facilitate clinics and workshops for elementary general music teachers. I was also the elementary general music team leader and writer on the Iowa Fine Arts Standards, Iowa's version of the National Core Art Standards. And remember, those standards really emphasize creativity. I have a couple of published articles on general music topics, and I'm currently working on a teacher resource book for embedding creative outcomes into the general music classroom. So not only does this study help to satisfy my personal curiosity and improve my own practice, it also should contribute to research on musical or music teacher development, provide a better understanding of creative self-efficacy development among elementary general music teachers. 
benefit several stakeholders like elementary general music teachers, K-12 music educators, music teacher trainers, professional development clinicians, and researchers interested in creativity and music education. Where I got stuck was with a conceptual framework, which is a scaffold that kind of allows you to better see the myriad facets of a research problem. I wanted and needed a holistic lens through which to view elementary general music teacher development. Then Dr. Cooper suggested Bronfenbrenner's bioecological model of human development, which is a framework where the interactions of a developing person with their immediate environment, the systems which indirectly impact the developing person, cultural influences, and time are all represented. With this conceptual framework, I had a really solid place to start in that I could comprehensively look at how elementary general music teachers' creative self-efficacy was influenced by their home, neighborhood, worship, and learning environments, and how that creative self-efficacy was impacted throughout the career and the lifetime by educational standards, school systems and their stakeholders, socioeconomic status, age, gender, and race. Once I had adapted Bronfenbrenner's model for my study, I knew how to organize the scholarly literature I had already read on the subject and what I still needed to learn. Right away, I started my literature review on the systems of my conceptual framework. But once again, Dr. Cooper helped me to realize that I was missing an important piece of the puzzle. How musical creativity came to be so important in music education. So I reviewed lots of information on the history of music education, and I included synthesis in my dissertation. Here are the 40 or so books and articles from which I created my account of how creative outcomes became a fundamental goal of music education. Then I jumped into looking for research that connected Bronfenbrenner systems to my research problem. For example, what research had been conducted that examined gender and creativity and creative self-efficacy and, and gender, both in general and among music teachers? What about age, race? socioeconomic status or standards, school policies and traditions, the expectations of stakeholders like families and subsequent music teachers, the home and the family environment, the community, worship settings, learning environment influences on creativity and creative self-efficacy and on music teacher development. I also looked at articles and information containing theoretical information on self-efficacy, creative self-efficacy, and read what I could find on how music teachers continued to engage with music throughout their lifetimes. Once I had a good handle on the research problem and knew that there was a gap around a comprehensive view of creative self-efficacy development among elementary general music teachers, I designed a philosophically aligned study that would help me to address that gap. I am kind of a math whiz, and I originally wanted to do an objectivist, quantitative study, but my research questions really needed to be answered with qualitative data. That being said, I also knew that casting a wide net nationwide to get a large sample with a lot of variation in age, experience level, SES, etc., would make interview-based research next to impossible on the timeline I'd set for myself. I'm nothing if not practical. So a pragmatic epistemology that would allow me the flexibility to collect data through practical means was a natural choice. Next, I chose a theoretical perspective, which was reflective of my research questions, called symbolic interactionism. Symbolic interactionism focuses on the unique perceptions and interpretations of individuals, exactly what I was hoping to uncover. Again, I knew that my research questions were best answered qualitatively, as qualitative research allows for participants' unique meanings to shine through. But I also knew that my research questions would be best answered by a large group from throughout the United States and would be very hard to collect data from interviews on that kind of scale. So I ultimately decided to build a basic qualitative study, again, practical, that would allow me to build an online data collection instrument using Qualtrics. Now I needed some participants, but before I could get permission for my study to begin, I had to have a plan on how I would recruit participants. So I decided that I would use the National Association for Music Education, also known as NAFME, and their listserv to contact their members who teach elementary general music within U.S. schools. NAFME was one of the organizations who built the national standards that have such a strong focus on creativity. Using NAFME, I was hoping I would be able to get more than 100 participants from diverse perspectives. I also hope that I would get a good representative sample. And when I say representative sample, I was hoping that my sample would have similar demographics to music teachers at large. This improves a study's transferability to other research settings. 
I also hope for maximum variation in age, gender identity, racial identity, level of education, annual household income, and years of experience teaching elementary general music, because all of these things can influence someone's perspective. In total, I had 179 participants, and I was really pleased with that number. And I got really good variation in age. As you can see here, my participants come from a range of ages. I also calculated their mean age as 43.3. Since the National Center for Education Statistics, or NCES, said that the mean age of public school teachers was 42.4 in 2020, I felt pretty good about that. My sample was heavily female, but the profession leans heavily towards females in the United States. According to NCES's 2018 data, public school fine arts classrooms are led by 76.5% female and 23.5% .5 male. So again, mine was slightly overrepresented by females. My sample also leaned heavily towards white teachers, but again, this is pretty representative of nationwide data, except for black or African-American teachers, who represent 6.7 of the nationwide teaching force, according to NCES 2018. My sample only had 1.1% black or African-American participants. I got good variation in educational level, although participants with doctoral degrees were overrepresented in this study, and those who have not yet completed a bachelor's degree, like teaching artists, were slightly underrepresented. I also got good variation in annual household income. I don't have any comparative data for you here, though. So salary data were collected using categories and a Likert type scale for my study, so a specific median income couldn't be calculated for comparison with the U.S. Census Bureau who reports that data. Um, just to give you an idea, the U.S. Census Bureau reported median income to be around 67000 in 2021. I also got strong variation in experience level, although participants in this study slightly underrepresent novice teachers and slightly overrepresent teachers who have been in the classroom for 30 years or more. I also planned several ways to improve my study's internal and external validity. My study included a statement of my positionality and a review of the literature, data saturation, which means I kept collecting and analyzing data until no new themes emerged. Peer review, which means that I discussed my interpretations with other academics to gauge their plausibility. An audit trail, which showed how I synthesized codes, which I'll talk about later, into thematic findings. Maximum sample variation, which you saw in my participant demographics to improve transferability. And I ended my dissertation with a statement of reflexivity, detailing how the research affected me, what the challenges were, and what I might have done differently. So I started to collect data, and as the data trickled in, I jumped into reading, annotating, and analyzing the qualitative data from the open-ended responses right away. I used some of the closed-ended responses to contextualize that data, but I waited until I had closed the questionnaire completely to crunch the demographics. Using InVivo, which is a qualitative data analysis software program, I started my initial coding, memoing, which is writing down my thoughts and observations as I coded, and I read and analyzed my data several times. By several, I mean like uh, 1,863,000. Uh, and Vivo kept a code book for me too, which was really useful when I started organizing similar codes into categories and themes. And when I went back to build my audit trail, I had that data handy. Then I went back through all my data again to make sure that I hadn't overlooked any big ideas, which I hadn't. I felt pretty good about that. But at about this time, my InVivo site license expired. <sighs> I bought the new version, but there were formatting changes between the two, and it really slowed me down. It was very frustrating. Lastly, I chose exemplar quotes from my participants that would appear in my findings. Before I get into my findings, I should acknowledge that my study was delimited to just those experiences relevant to Braun from Brenner's bioecological model of human development, and only NAFME members who teach elementary general music within U.S. schools contributed data. There were also some limitations. The online anonymous questionnaire worked great, but it was the only data collection instrument. So I wasn't able to triangulate data from other sources. I wasn't able to go back to my participants and have them gut check my interpretations either. The questionnaire also kept me from observing physical and verbal nuance like you might be able to see in a live interview. 
The questionnaire also only went to NAFME members, who might have different perspectives and experiences than music teachers at large, and only those who were able to use the technology were able to provide data. Now for the exciting part, my findings. First, there are a couple of important insights from the data that lie outside of my thematic findings. The first of these is that it was important to understand how elementary general music teachers defined musical creativity in their classrooms. To that end, I asked each participant to accept, alter, or amend the textbook definition of creativity as it would apply to their classrooms. Then I synthesized their responses into this definition, and I kept it in mind during analysis and write-up. Musical creativity is the generation, through exploration, embellishment, arrangement, improvisation, and composition of musical products and ideas that communicate emotion, fulfill an aesthetic purpose, and demonstrate command of musical concepts and or skills. Because this study was focused on how elementary general music teachers develop their creative self-efficacy and how that creative self-efficacy manifests in classroom practice, it was also important to gauge participants' self-perceptions regarding their creative self-efficacy and their ability to nurture creativity in others. These tables show that about 90% of participants agreed or strongly agreed that they were confident in their personal creative ability, and about 80% of participants felt similarly about their ability to nurture creativity in their students. Analyzing the remaining data led to six themes that helped to answer the research questions. Those are presented in this table, as well as how each theme relates back to my conceptual framework. I will give you a quick summary first. For research question one, how elementary general music teachers describe the people, processes, and contexts that influence their creative self-efficacy development, participants described formal pre-service training as generally lacking opportunities to develop creative self-efficacy, but with professional learning and collaboration upon and after entering the profession, participants improve their creative self-efficacy and their ability to nurture creativity. This is represented by theme one and lands squarely in Bronfen Brenner's microsystems or the immediate environment which contains the individual. Creative self-efficacy development was both positively and negatively influenced by role models. That was theme two. Because there were a lot of overlaps between the home, community, and worship environments, theme two is a mesosystem theme. Socioeconomics and time were also found to influence creative self-efficacy development. Those are themes five and six. According to the conceptual framework, socioeconomics lie in the macro system, and time is the chrono system. In summary of research question two, how general music teachers operationalize their creative self-efficacy in their classrooms, Creative classroom practices were influenced by role models from several microsystems. Again, because there's an interaction there, this is a mesosystem theme. The school environment also affects how creative self-efficacy translates into creative classroom practices. Since school policies, educational standards, and expectations from stakeholders like upper-level music teachers or parents indirectly influence the practices of elementary general music teachers, this system is an exosystem theme. And they share the ways in which student needs and preferences influence creative classroom practices. That's theme four, another exosystem theme. Finally, the manifestation of creative self-efficacy is affected by socioeconomics and time, themes five and six, which are macrosystem and chronosystem themes, respectively. The first theme in my finding centered on participants' formal musical training in school, private lessons, and ensembles, and even those experiences that they'd had as undergraduate music education majors which were really all laser focused on performing other people's music. For some, creativity was actively discouraged during this time, but for others, the total lack of emphasis on creativity had a passively discouraging effect. I should mention that those who enrolled in specific programs like jazz or composition classes did mention creative decision making, like when to perform faster or slower, or louder or softer, etc. And some improvisation and composition work, but these were almost always described as more algorithmic than freely creative. You know, how closely can you follow the rules of the Baroque era, etc. This sub theme is summed up pretty well by this quote down here. It's like being an art student and seeing how good you can get at reproducing someone else's paintings. However, 
When these music teachers entered the profession, they quickly realized that they had creative deficits in their own ability to be creative and to nurture creativity in their students, or sometimes even both. These deficits were addressed with professional learning and professional collaboration. An example can be found in the first quote. It's also important to mention that professional development relevant to music teachers was very rarely provided by school systems the participants served. But team collaboration and sharing time was a fairly typical replacement for that PD. Participants use these opportunities to build creative self-efficacy and get ideas on how to foster creativity in their students. You can read an example right here in this quote. Also, many participants mention specific methodological training like ORF and Fire Robin that help them to both build creative self-efficacy in themselves and promote creativity in their classrooms. I pulled a couple exemplar quotes for you here, too. The second theme in my findings is about the influence of role models in their homes, community, peer groups, and worship settings. Regarding home and family, some participants described how their families really encouraged their musical creativity, which led to strong creative self-efficacy. Here's an example. Others described that creativity was discouraged at home, which led to weak creative self-efficacy. Still others shared that a clear focus on performance skills led to poor creative self-efficacy, but recognizing that this was detrimental took explicit steps to do better for their own students. Still others shared, sorry, the second sub-theme for theme two resulted in, just a second, I want to make note of that. Slide 69. The second sub-theme for theme two resulted from descriptions of the ways in which peer and community groups contributed to creative self-efficacy development. In general, descriptions detailed how peers and community influencers encouraged participation in music, both in general and regarding musical performance and creativity specifically. Here's an example. But some participants described competition among friends as powerful motivators to focus on performance skills rather than dabble in creative music making. They wanted to get really good at performance so that they could compete with their friends. Kind of like how my kids do with video games. The final sub-theme for theme three came from descriptions of the influence of role models in religious settings. More than a third of all participants said that music and musical involvement in their respective houses of worship had a profound effect on their overall musical development, their performance skill development, their creative music making abilities, and their classroom practices. For example, participants often described worship music that centered around ensembles like band, chorus, and orchestra. Often these ensembles provided opportunity for practice of creative skills, which often led to improved creative self-efficacy. This was especially true when participants described involvement with collaboratively managed ensembles, like praise band or special music groups. That kind of involvement often translated into stronger creative classroom practices. On the other hand, those who were in ensembles with a single director often performed only formally composed liturgical music. In these cases, performance was the only focus, so creative self-efficacy was not developed and no strategies for fostering creativity in the classroom were learned. Two exosystem themes are also part of my findings. First, school system policies were found to provide considerable latitude for elementary general music teachers to choose day-to-day -day activities.
but the choice of what to teach and when to teach it often limited their autonomy to choose what concepts those activities should support or how much time they could spend on them. Even for those participants for whom creative music making were expectations, tightly controlled curricular pacing and clear emphasis on performance skills like reading music notation made it difficult to explore creative outcomes with so many other outcomes to achieve. See here you can see that they're only talking about reading and notating. The second sub-theme for theme three came from participant descriptions of the presence of educational standards. More than 80% of participants shared that their school systems have or plan to have national core art standards reflected in their curriculum documents. And again, the national standards really emphasize creative outcomes. But participants also cited a lack of oversight in whether or not those standards are actually framing instruction. Here's a couple example quotes. In some cases, it was only the music teachers themselves who worked to honor the standards, as no clear guidelines were established or communicated. In many cases, the lack of oversight actually led to improved creative outcomes, as teachers were free to privilege whatever artistic processes that met their instructional needs, and student and teacher preferences, of course. In other cases, participants felt no pressure to address creative standards and thus focused their instruction on performance skills. Part of the performance focus might be due to other educational stakeholders and their narrow definitions of music literacy as notation and performance skills. This was plainly stated by several participants, but what was not stated was just as telling. Only three participants mentioned creative music making as an expectation from upper level music teachers. But two of those three were actually the upper level music teachers they were describing. So they taught either K-12 or K-8. And a single participant sort of mentioned creativity in their description of parent expectations. But that comment indicated that parents were surprised that creative music making was happening in the classroom. Theme four came from descriptions of the ways in which attuning to student needs and preferences often resulted in more opportunities to promote musical creativity. Many participants mentioned that students very much enjoy the agency that creative music making provides and that others mentioned creative music making as both a window to, into someone's relationship with music and an excellent way to see evidence of assimilated skills. Participants also noted that creative music making can be used to address diverse instructional and non-instructional needs, like relationship building, social awareness, collaborative skills, or addressing physical and cognitive limitations. For the second sub-theme for theme four, details of how COVID-19 affected creative music making were really surprising to me, primarily because so many participants wrote about COVID despite no mention of COVID in the questionnaire. To give you some perspective, COVID-19 led to an existential crisis for music education. Summer of 2020, we didn't even know if we would have jobs in the fall. Singing had been identified as a super spreader activity Social distancing made dancing impossible, and socially distant dancing, by the way, is not as fun as it looks on TikTok. Even sharing materials like pencils or mallets or percussion instruments were severely limited by disinfection regimens. Wind instruments could only be played outside in Iowa. Since the whole curriculum is sing, dance, play, create, well, one participant summed this up with everything, as you know, was a mess for approximately two years, and it was. It really was. An interesting piece of the COVID puzzle came down to this. Even though performances and demonstrations were effectively 
canceled for all of 2020 and 2021. Many participants were stuck with pacing guides that demanded unpractisable skills like singing, dancing, and instrument playing. I think all the teachers that are at my dissertation defense would agree that education is a little bit like the Titanic. It can't just turn on a dime. So with all the factors at play, some participants responded by rejecting their pacing guides and filling the time as best they could with whatever they could find. Others stuck to the guides despite all the limitations. Still others shied away from creative projects, which might require singing, dancing, playing instruments, or working closely in groups, all just to avoid spreading the virus. In other words, COVID-19 both positively and negatively affected creative classroom practices. That's such an understatement, but yeah. So moving on to theme five, economic circumstances were found to have a complicated impact on creative music making. While those who grew up with favorable socioeconomic standings had increased access to instruments, lessons, camps, those who engaged with those experiences often reported strong emphasis on performance skills. Those who had favorable economic resources as adults also had improved access to training that could build their creative self-efficacy and their ability to nurture creativity. And they could have the financial freedom to be motivated by the music to be made instead of the paycheck to be earned. And they could have the financial freedom to be motivated by the, I need to change that. Sorry, dad. On the other hand, those facing poor socioeconomic situations often engage in creative problem solving, both while growing up and in economically disadvantaged schools that they now teach in, to enable creative and improvisatory music making with just whatever is available. In other words, it really comes down to not the hand that someone was dealt, but how they played that hand the best there to take advantage musically and creatively. There was also a major player in time in the creative self-efficacy development of participants and their ability to foster creative classroom environments. In general, most participants noted that their creative competence improved as they aged, spent time in the classroom, or engaged in professional learning. Participants also noted that students feel more confident to be creative when they spend protracted time in a creative nurturing environment. So bigger kids who spent more time with the teacher felt more comfortable being creative. Participants also described how limited time with students produces obstacles to effectively nurture creative thinking and behavior. Mind you that 94%, well, of those who provided frequency data said that they see their students once or twice a week. And while this is usually the same frequency as art, PE, and other specialists see this kids, the music teacher almost always has a performance or more than one to orchestrate in the same amount of contact time. Even when participants indicated strong creative self-efficacy, the frequency of, music, frequency of music classes and performances left little time for creative work. One participant even said that creativity is the first thing to cut if I'm short on time. There were a lot of overlaps between themes and the research questions, so I included a summary of how each research question is answered by its associated themes. Here are the themes, themes 1, 2, 5, and 6, that answer research question 1. And here are the themes two through six that answer research question two. Now for the final section. Once my study had produced findings, I went back to the literature to see how the findings related to what was already known on the subject. Several findings of this study were supported by prior literature, but there are also several findings that added to what we now know about this research problem. 
This is all part of what's called implications or the so what of the findings. What was added to the knowledge base as a result of the study, how that information might be used to improve practice or maybe even to spark new research. To begin, this study adds to what's known about creative self-efficacy development among elementary general music teachers by illuminating the impacts of peer and community influences on creative self-efficacy development, the influence of role models within worship settings on creative self-efficacy development and creative classroom practices, the function of high autonomy and low accountability in the daily planning practices of elementary general music teachers, the influences of COVID-19 on the creative experiences of teachers and students in elementary general music, the complicated roles of socioeconomics and time in the development of creative self-efficacy among teachers and students. I believe that this information can be used to improve practice for current and future music teachers, as well as music teacher trainers, school administrators, and parents. First of all, the findings show that formal musical training de-emphasizes creativity. Changing that practice would be a good place to start. The findings also show that favorable economic circumstances can improve access to experiences that can enrich creative self-efficacy. So practicing music teachers can work to develop ways to remove economic barriers for kids by providing access to lessons and instruments. For example, band teachers usually offer instruments at no cost for those receiving free and reduced benefit, lunch benefits at school. Practicing music teachers also need to more effectively balance their time so that there is time available for creative work, especially when they're autonomous and can choose whatever activities they want with their time. This study's findings also suggest that collaboration was powerful practice to build creative self-efficacy and prepare teachers to nurture creativity. So collaborating with each other and with pre-service teachers through mentoring, outreach, and practicum experiences is another important step. Speaking of pre-service teachers, those currently studying to become music teachers should advocate for an education which promotes comprehensive music literacy, which includes creative music making. When creative needs aren't being met, future teachers need to speak up. Contemporary teaching practices emphasize collaborative classroom environments and encourage the open sharing of ideas. Future teachers should take advantage of these situations and ask for what they will undoubtedly need in their future classrooms. Again, the study's findings also suggested that collaboration was a powerful practice to build creative self-efficacy and prepare teachers to nurture creativity. So collaborating with practicing teachers is another important step. Music teacher trainers should promote the development of their students' creative self-efficacy and give them the tools through modeling and through explicit instruction to foster creativity in their future classrooms. I know from personal experience how easy it is to just keep on doing what I've always done. Changing practices now will improve the future of music education in higher ed. School administrators also have a role to play. Creativity is fundamental to the human experience and necessary for solving tomorrow's problems. All of education should be promoting creativity. Comprehensive music literacy, which includes creative music making in addition to strong performance skills, should be promoted by school administrators and appear in curriculum documents. School administrators also control funding priorities. If a school district can't provide training that is applicable to their specialists, then funding should be made available so that those specialists can get outside of the school system the kind of training their generalists get in-house. School administrators should also devote funds to increasing access to musical and creative experiences for their students who are less fortunate. Finally, parents should encourage musical creativity. Of course, I'm in support of every parent who wants their child to take music lessons, but the music on the page of a child's method book is no more valuable than the music that lives inside their heart and their mind. Simply repurposing a couple of minutes of practice time for creativity or just praising a child's creative attempts might be enough for them to believe in themselves. Just think of that. It would be amazing. I also have several recommendations for future research. First, participants said that professional learning and collaboration were strong sources of creative self-efficacy and the creative opportunities that they give to their students. So future research studies could look at the impacts of professional learning, specific professional learning, like, like or Schulwerk, or Kodai, the Fire Robin model, and others, and collaborative experiences like mentoring programs, professional learning communities, etc., 
on creative self-efficacy in classroom practice. Second, examining this research problem through other conceptual frameworks might provide further insight by refocusing data collection through a different lens. Third, future research seeking to answer similar research questions could use a phenomenological methodology where interviews would serve as the primary data collection instrument. The kind of research would undoubtedly utilize a smaller sample of participants, but a more in-depth understanding of the phenomenon might be reached. The findings of this study also revealed that school-related demands influence creative classroom practice in elementary general music. With the existence of so many arts integration programs, which promote teaching general education content through a fine arts lens, case study research might provide an enriched perspective of how creativity can be fostered by an elementary education at large via one of these bounded systems. Finally, I personally hope to conduct research on the impacts of COVID-19 on elementary general music so that wisdom gained from the pandemic might be recorded both for posterity and in the event of a future crisis, like monkeypox, for example. To date, there is nothing out there about general music and the pandemic. There are currently about a dozen published articles about mitigation strategies in performing ensembles, but zero published research articles. Now I'd like to open it up to questions. <laughs> 